This is going to be a slightly different kind of talk than I think we've had so far. Um, it's almost not historical at all. Uh, the historical context is that, uh, as many of you know, uh, Wittgenstein was an avid and ardent reader of Tolstoy. And um, rather than do a study of the influence of Tolstoy and Wittgenstein, I want to reverse it and see if Wittgenstein can help us understand Tolstoy. Because I think that some of even the Problemstellungen, the initial problems, especially about skepticism, that Tolstoy wrestled with uh, were inherited by Wittgenstein and that he took some inspiration from Tolstoy. Uh, I also think that Wittgenstein might be able to correct or help um, clarify some of the issues um, in Tolstoy. Um, so I'm taking him seriously as a thinker and I'm asking about Tolstoy's actualität um, as um, a thinker of philosophical aesthetics. So today I'd like to discuss with you Tolstoy's theory of art as he expounds it in his treatise Stotoko Iskustva, What is Art? A text he worked on for many years and which he considered one of the most important and influential expositions of what has come to be called the expression theory of art. The theory in general is identified with philosophies of art put forward subsequently by people like Collingwood or Dewey among others, though my focus today is on Tolstoy alone. More specifically, I'm going to draw on some thoughts of Ludwig Wittgenstein to defend with certain qualifications Tolstoy's theory. Wittgenstein wrote, I quote, there is much to be learned from Tolstoy's false theorizing about how a work of art conveys a feeling, end quote. And I hope my talk today goes some way to adjudicating Wittgenstein's judgment about Tolstoy. The central claim of the expression theory of art is that an artwork should be understood as an expression of a psychological state typically but not necessarily that of the artwork's creator. The psychological state may be cognitive, that is a belief, a hope, or some other propositional attitude, or it may be non-cognitive, a feeling, a mood, or an emotion. And the means of expression may be indirect and hence require interpretation. So for instance, a metaphor, a symbol, an image, or some other literary rhetorical device. Or the means of expression may be direct, something like the manifestation of the emotion. In this context, then, Tolstoy's expressivism is a distinct species of the genus expression theory of art, since his theory, as I understand it, holds that the psychological state that is expressed in an artwork is an emotion and that the expression is direct, in the sense that the understanding or uptake by the person experiencing the artwork of the emotion expressed by the artwork is immediate or non-inferential, hence requiring no interpretation in the sense of justification where justification would be the invocation of grounds that inferentially lead to and support that understanding. Tolstoy's own short description of his theory is this, and this is um, quote one on the handout, to call up in oneself a feeling once experienced and having called it up to convey it by means of movements, lines, colors, sounds, images expressed in words, so that others experience the same feeling. In this consists the activity of art. Art is that human activity which consists in one person's consciously conveying to others by certain external signs, the feelings he has experienced, and in others being infected by those feelings and also experiencing them. So basically the expression theory amounts to the claim that there is a mode of understanding signs or other aesthetic material in which the sign or material directly manifests its meaning content, in Tolstoy's case a distinct emotion, without the necessary recourse to an act of interpretation an act where reason or ground or justification is sought uh, in taking the sign to have the meaning content it does. I think it's fair to say that this picture of aesthetic understanding does not enjoy much credence in recent literary circles, so where what Paul Ricoeur called the hermeneutics of suspicion holds sway. Approaches to literature uh, that adopt a skeptical stance towards the apparent meaning content of an artwork and deploy various modes of justification in their interpretations up to the denial of any stable meaning content at all, as in certain varieties of deconstruction. Related attacks on the expression theory animate philosophical aesthetics, and today I will examine some of those arguments against the expression theory of art and offer a modest defense of Tolstoy's view. I'm going to focus on the genre of pure music, that is, music that does not realistically or mimetically represent any concrete object, in contrast to, say, program music, as, for instance, in an opera, a French horn mimetically represents a hunting horn, say, to indicate that the hunting party has returned to the castle or whatever. Pure music is the hard case for an expression theory of art because other genres, such as drama, fiction, or poetry, have devices by which to represent emotions and therefore, so it's argued, more easily convey distinct emotions, 
as when they are described by a narrator or named by a lyrical speaker or dramatic figure. But if we were to limit the genres under consideration to some forms of psychological realism, say, Tolstoy's theory would be far less provocative. For in what is art, he seems to be championing the inculcation, transmission, and elicitation of emotions regardless of genre. Indeed, regardless of whether the art forms in question are representational or not. And indeed, in his novella Kreutzer Sonata, which he wrote while working on what is art, Tolstoy dramatizes the effects of Beethoven's music on his murderous protagonist. Therefore, here I will focus on the hard case of non-representational art form of instrumental music and argue that even here, in what Wittgenstein called, quote, the most sophisticated art of all, unquote, Tolstoy's expression theory of art can be vindicated or at least rendered plausible. Before I begin to defend the theory, let me make some initial simplifications and qualifications in order to focus the arguments to come. <coughs> As you know, there is a rich literature in philosophy, psychology, cognitive science, anthropology, and so on, on the nature of emotions. Emotions have been taken to range from the momentary startle response on the one hand to lasting grief and nostalgia that may take years on the other. Some think emotions and rationality are related, others think not. For my purposes here, I'm concerned with what could be called garden variety emotions like sadness or anger. And I hold that they are sui generis response dependent mental states, that is mental states that respond to some um, trigger, including the following features. Uh, they have a, ph a phenomenology or feeling dimension, what it feels like to be angry, a cognitive judgment or evaluation or sense of fittingness, that it's right to be angry in this case, um, often dispositional behavioral or what are sometimes called action tendencies, and lastly, physiological characteristics such, such as autonomic responses. Next, let me draw a distinction Tolstoy does not make between empathetic and sympathetic emotional responses. According to standard definitions, if I perceive that you have a migraine headache and in response I feel pain or discomfort as well, then I'm responding empathetically. If, however, I myself don't feel your pain, as it were, but rather feel concern or compassion and fetch you a painkiller, I'm responding sympathetically. One of the examples of genuine artworks that Tolstoy provides is a genre painting by the English painter Langley that, quote, in his words, uh, depicts a wandering beggar boy who has apparently been asked in by a woman who feels sorry for him, end quote. Presumably the audience is meant to identify empathetically with the woman who feels sorry for the beggar boy. But we could imagine a painting of the beggar boy alone, which would express perhaps anxiety, sadness, or despair, but would elicit the sympathetic emotional response of pity or even moral indignation. So we should adjust Tolstoy's theory to account for these cases as well. So while I think he uh, assumes that all emotional responses will be empathetic, we should, I think, um, like an expression theory of art to allow for both sympathetic and empathetic responses. Furthermore, furthermore some might read the first line of the first quotation, the one I uh, read just a minute ago, from Tolstoy as denying that the artist is actually undergoing the emotion her artwork will then express. When he writes that, quote, to call up in oneself a feeling once experienced and having called it up to convey it, we might take him to be allowing that an artist would recollect in tranquility, say, an emotion that she would not actually feel but merely represent to herself. I think there are strong philosophical reasons for rejecting this model of memory, and Gareth Evans is a place to go for arguments to that effect, uh, but I can't justify that here. I can only say obscurely, we don't remember our remembering, we recall what we saw and what we felt. Uh, and we see and feel that again in the mode of remembrance. So for the purposes of this paper, I take undergoing an emotion and recalling or imagining an emotion to be relevantly similar. So I'm not going to pay attention to those distinctions. I'll add one further qualification letter, uh, later as my argument unfolds. But I think we've done enough stage setting to start the argument proper. We can motivate the dispute in philosophical aesthetics at hand by considering a favorite example from the literature. A St. Bernard or a Basset Hound looks sad. You have to grant me that or else the paper's over already. It looks sad. And we might also concede it elicits a corresponding responsive emotion in us, sadness or pity or something, uh, more or less directly. However, so goes the criticism. It would be a fallacy to think or infer that the Basset Hound really is sad. Similarly, from the expressive qualities of an artwork, it would be a fallacy to infer that the artist was in the corresponding psychological or emotional state. That's the real sort of nub of the criticism of, of the expression theory of art. 
On this view, there need, there need not be any essential relationship between the expressive qualities of the artwork on the one hand and the mental or emotional state of the artist on the other. Adherents of this view therefore introduce a fundamental distinction and claim that an artwork can be expressive of an emotion rather than that the artwork expresses an emotion. And that's the primary distinction. So, it can be ex so the, the, the Basset Hound's face is expressive of sadness, but it doesn't express sadness because the Basset Hound is not sad. There's no psychological state corresponding to it. Good so far? OK. Um, this is, I believe, a problem for a successful reconstruction of Tolstoy's theory. For Tolstoy seems to hold that an artwork expresses its creator's emotions, rather than merely being expressive of an emotion, and that the audience responds, empathetically or sympathetically, to that expressed emotion, as in the quote on the handout. In non-artistic cases of human expression, we take the person's expression, so facial expression would be the premier example, to reveal her psychological state, and her psychological state to explain her expression. More strongly, there is a logical, that is a non-contingent and constitutive relationship between many psychological states and their expressions. Part of what it means to be sad is to have, or at least have the disposition to have, an expression of sadness. The person manifests her sadness in her expression, and we see her sadness in her face, or in her expression, or in her behavior. This is the everyday, or we could say the naive picture of human emotional life, um, that I mentioned above. That emotions often essentially involve particular sorts of mental states with particular phenomenological qualities and behavioral dispositions, including facial dispositions and dispositions to act certain ways. So, more concretely, for example, the mental state of anger involves a distinctive way it feels to be angry, a distinctive facial expression, physiological autonomic responses, such as an increased heart rate or vascular dilation, and perhaps even action dispositions such as a tendency to clench one's fists or tighten one's gaze or whatever. That would be the full sort of picture of an emotion on the, on the, the, the view I'm uh, trying to uh, advocate for. On this naive view then, there is a kind of necessary unity to these different aspects that together constitute the particular human emotion in question. In the case of an artwork, however, many philosophers of art contend that there is no such essential relationship between expression and psychological state. Peter Kivy, elaborating an argument made first, I believe, by Alan Torme, provides a quick reductio to support the denial of such a relationship in the context of musical expression. And this is quote two on your handout. Many and perhaps most of our emotive descriptions of music are logically independent of the states of mind of the composers of that music. Whereas whether my clenched fist is or is not an expression of anger is logically dependent on whether or not I am angry. It is unthinkable that I should amend my characterization of the opening bars of Mozart's G minor symphony as somber, brooding, and melancholy if I were to discover evidence of Mozart's happiness during its composition. But that is exactly what I would have to do, just as I must cease to characterize a clenched fist as an expression of anger if I discover that the fist clencher is not angry. This is a matter of logic. So that's a, a statement that motivates, again, the distinction between something being expressive of an emotion versus expressing an emotion. So it is this argument from logical independence that motivates the distinction between an artwork expressing an emotion and its being merely expressive of that emotion. The former exhibits the logically dependent or constitutive relation between expression and psychological state, whereas the latter does not. Recall the illustrative example of the St. Bernard of the Basset Hound, whose face is expressive of sadness independently of whatever psychological state of mind the dog may be in. Artworks, the argument runs by analogy, can thus be expressive of emotions without expressing their creator's emotional states. If artworks are logically independent of their creator's emotional states, then Tolstoy's expression theory of art would require a significant revision. In the weaker version of the theory, one could speak of the artwork's expressiveness or suggestiveness of emotion, while the stronger version would hold that an artwork uh, nonetheless can transmit or convey an emotion to its audience by expressing that emotion. So the weaker version accepts that an artwork's expressiveness is logically independent of its creator's psychological states, whereas the stronger version denies that logical independence. So now the question is, do we have to accept this claim of logical independence? Carefully and successfully evaluating this claim of logical independence requires identifying and setting aside three misleading lines of thought at the very beginning. And I'm here um, uh, resuming some ideas from Aaron Ridley. 
So the first misleading thought is that an expressive artwork has merely an instrumental relationship to uh, the emotion it conveys or elicits. Here the logical independence is taken to be a contingent relationship between the expressive features of the artwork on the one hand and the transmission of emotion on the other. If the emotion is separable or detachable from the nature of the artwork, because the artwork is a mere vehicle or means for eliciting or conveying the emotion, then the function of the artwork could be replaced by any other means, some other artwork, a drug, hypnosis, whatever, that reliably produces the emotional response. Conceiving the emotional response of a specific artwork as somehow detachable in this way seems to falsify genuine aesthetic experience as when Wittgenstein himself writes, and this is quote three, it has sometimes been said that what music conveys to us are feelings of joyfulness, melancholy, triumph, etc., etc., and what repels us in this account is that it seems to say that music is an instrument for producing in us sequences of feelings. And from this, one might gather that any other means of producing such feelings would do for us instead of music. To such an account, we are tempted to reply, music conveys to us itself, that somehow music, the, the music would be denatured. So the intuition here is that the artwork's expressiveness cannot be separated from what it expresses or is expressive of without changing the nature of the artwork, as though it were possible to detach the sadness of an elegiac passage of music without thereby altering the constitution of the passage itself. So that's the first misleading thought to set aside. A second misleading thought is the line of reasoning that proceeds from the observation that people sometimes conceal or feign their emotional state to the conclusion that outer expressiveness and inner psychological state must therefore be non-constitutive and merely contingent. This is a misleading line of thought because refaining an emotional state rests parasitically on the genuine expression of emotion, which is logically prior. The concept of feigned emotion, like the concept of false promise, logically presupposes the concept of genuine emotional expression and sincere promises. Likewise, perhaps a happy Mozart composed a somber symphony analogously to a happy person feigning a somber mood. The very possibility, let alone success of the feint, however, depends on the logically prior relationship of an emotional state being constitutively manifested, at least dispositionally, in the emotional expression. So that's the second argument to set aside. The third misleading thought is a line of reasoning that proceeds from the observation that many human emo uh, emotional expressions are natural, whereas the expressive capacities of artworks are artificial, in the sense that they are often thoroughly dependent on conventions. But this line of thinking rests on an equivocation of the word artificial, a shift from the sense of being the opposite of natural to the sense of being the opposite of genuine. But while some human expressions of emotion are natural, so my face naturally turns red if I'm angry, many expressions of emotion are conventional, such as linguistic expressions, my exclaiming how dare you, or gestures, my elevating a certain finger. And in ordinary non-artistic context, we take these conventional expressions to be just as much genuine manifestations of emotional states as we do genuine natural expressions of those same states. So conventionalism is not gonna be a viable way to go here as well. But by diffusing, these, by diffusing these three misleading thoughts, I have sought to undermine the motivations for the distinction between expression and expressiveness from the side of human expression, as it were. We can try to do the same thing from the side of aesthetic, aesthetic expression. One of the most sophisticated theories of aesthetic expressiveness, and hence the denial of aesthetic expression, is Gerald Levinson's so-called persona theory which develops earlier theories that claim that an artwork's expressive characteristics resemble characteristics of a human being. So in this theory, somber music is slow, resembling the gait of a sad person, and so on. Levinson claims that in order to perceive emotions in musical passages, the listener must imagine, in his words, an indefinite agent or persona, a subject uh, to whom the emotional state can be attributed imaginatively because, his quote, if expressive music is music readily heard as or as if expression, and if in addition expression requires an expressor, then personae or agents, however minimal, just are presupposed in the standard experience of such music." End quote. So the imagined projection of a persona is one removed from the perception of the creator's emotional state in her artistic work. And it reflects the continuing presence of that logical independence claim. But it is, I think, an unnecessary complication that arises only in certain situations, and that's now the line I want to pursue. One of those special situations, and here I come to my final qualification to Tolstoy's theory, is the case where there is no single creator of the artwork. 
and so a fortiori no psychological state that the artwork could express in the naive sense I've described above. In what is art, Tolstoy, as I recollect from the text, Tolstoy provides four examples of what he calls authentic or genuine artworks that express determinate emotions. The first is the example of a peasant woman uh, singing a wedding song that lifts. that lifts his despondent mood. The second is an anonymous tale in a children's magazine of a mother's love for her children, which concludes with a proverb. The third is the genre painting I talked about before, the woman and the beggar boy. And the fourth is a shamanistic performance by a Siberian hunter-gatherer people, the Vogel, <laughs> depicting a bow hunter wounding a calf who clings to its protective mother while the hunter prepares to strike again, so that, quote from Tolstoy, one hears deep <coughs> sighs and even weeping, end quote, in the audience. You see the problem. Tolstoy repeatedly claims that the artist's feeling is what is conveyed by the artwork, but it is possible that the first and fourth examples, the wedding song, the peasant wedding song, and the shamanistic performance, were not in fact produced by a single artist at all, or that the process of composition was extended over several people, or indeed even over several generations. This suggests that there may not need to be a single feeling or a single mental state as the causal origin of the artwork. Rather, the feeling conveyed may itself be a product rather than producer of the artwork. In these cases, we should follow expressivist theories like that of Levinson and postulating a persona manifested by the expressive qualities of the artwork, such that this persona, and not necessarily the factual artist, if there is one, is the locus of the mental state expressed by the artwork. So in these cases, there is an independence between artist and artwork because there is no single artist related to the artwork in the required way. So in these cases, I think we do need to qualify Tolstoy's theory and concede that such artworks are merely expressive of an emotion that the audience attributes to a persona or a <coughs> fictional figure. But these cases do not impugn those cases in which there is an artist appropriate related to the artwork, such that the artist's feelings is expressed in the artwork. So that's the concession that I'm, I'm willing to make. I can bring out the special nature of these cases in which we would invoke a persona and thereby deny the inclination to generalize the persona theory by imagining other special cases. So consider the case where I receive a handwritten letter from a friend and I discern that his handwriting looks angry. On Levinson's account, I'm entitled or even required to imaginally project a persona or indefinite agent distinct from the letter writer to whom I imaginatively attribute the state of being angry. But these recommended or required interpretive somersaults are indicative that something has gone wrong. For in my ordinary life, I immediately see that my friend is angry because his anger is manifested or apparent in his handwriting. It is only if other further considerations come to my attention. For instance, that a recent hand injury has affected his writing ability, or that he is feigning anger in order to manipulate my feelings, or that he is starting a new game of pretend handwriting and seeing what I'll do. It is only in these special cases that I will retreat to the more circumspect and skeptical attitude of postulating an intermediary persona and then asking to what degree this persona might coincide with my friend. In this context, an observation by Wittgenstein of one's everyday understanding of a linguistic symbol is quite appropriate. And this is quote four in the handout. What happens is not that this symbol cannot be further interpreted, but I do know interpreting. I do not interpret because I feel at home or heimish in the present picture. When I interpret, I step from one level of thought to another. That is, I feel at home, as it were, seeing my friend's anger expressed in his handwriting. Such perception is immediate and non-inferential, and I am exiled, as it were, from that familiarity only by the impingement of special circumstances that incite my will to question and interpret, that, mo that move me from the level of immediate understanding to the skeptical level of considering justifications, evidence, and inferences. Wittgenstein seems to suggest similar thinking in the case of understanding a musical theme as well, and in other passages of facial expression. So these are the quotes uh, that are under five, and I included several because uh, when I started working on this, it's astonishing that uh, this comes from both his earliest writings and his latest writings. So this is a through line through the so-called early Wittgenstein and later Wittgenstein. Um, so if we look at the first quote in five, understanding a sentence is much more akin to understanding a theme in music than one may think. What I mean is that understanding a sentence lies nearer than one thinks to what is ordinarily called understanding a musical theme. Or the fourth one, a theme not less than a face wears an expression. 
Here too, when one is at home with the music, one hears the emotion in the music, without the skeptical inclination to search for an explanation or justification. As he says in the final quote on the handout, when a theme, a phrase suddenly says something to you, you don't have to be able to explain it to yourself. Suddenly this gesture too is accessible to you. And that's from one of his, his last writings. So what gives rise to the philosophical distinction between expressing an emotion and being expressive of an emotion, or the general retreat to the imaginative projection of a persona in the experience of emotionally expressive music? One possibility is that it is a consequence of Cartesianism, the positive gulf between inner mental state and outer bodily or behavioral appearance. For that gulf entails that outer, appearances, outer appearance is detachable from the emotion, which is now relegated to an independent and merely introspectable inner realm rather than the human being in her entirety. The Wittgensteinian alternative to this Cartesianism is to embrace a holistic understanding of psychological concepts, including emotion concepts, as including mental representations, phenomenological and physiological qualities, and behavioral dispositions. That is precisely the picture of emotions I presented earlier on. As Wittgenstein writes at one point in the Philosophical Investigations, quote, it comes to this, only of a living human being and what resembles or behaves like a living human being can one say it has sensations, it sees, is blind, hears, is deaf, is conscious or unconscious, or I would say has, has an emotional life. Now one might object that in cases of pretense or physical failures, say due to facial paralysis and so on, it only seems as if a person's face is expressing an emotion or sadness, say. And this is the final argument that will be raised against this view. So this is one I want to pay a little more attention to. So one might object that in the case of pretending or in physical failure like facial paralysis, it only seems as if a person's face is expressing an emotion, say sadness. Like the Basset Hound, the person's face is expressive of or has the appearance of sadness, but does not really express sadness in such cases. One is tempted to say that the corresponding inner mental state is not itself one of sadness. Therefore, what is common to both false, insincere, or physically impaired on the one hand, and veridical on the other, expressions of emotion, is merely the identical or independent appearance. And an observer has epistemic access only to the appearance, not the inner emotional state of the person. Is everyone okay about the, the idea? Okay. Um, and one might go on to extrapolate this line of reasoning to the aesthetic experience of artworks, and likewise conclude that the audience has access only to the artwork's expressive qualities, what, the, the emotions that seem to be apparent in the artwork, but that the artwork does not express emotion. Note that an unwelcome consequence of the objector's line of reasoning here is that one can never know the emotional state of another. Because at best one can have a belief with some degree of confidence based on the appearance of the other. The appearance, false or veridical, will always be an independent epistemic intermediary between the observer and the inner state of the other. The observer will necessarily take the appearance as evidence for inferring to the belief that the other's inner state is such and such. But such evidence will at best afford some degree of confidence in the belief, not knowledge. Taking the expressiveness of a face uh, as appearance, identical and veridical in false cases alike, and thus always inviting skepticism, we lose each other. We are exiled from one another. Those of you familiar with the philosophy of perception will recognize this picture as, an underlying, as one underlying the so-called argument from illusion. Because I may be in error in my perceptual belief that there is a lectern now before me, I should retreat to the certainty that it seems to me as though there is a lectern standing before me, whereby the appearance of a lectern before me is identical in my veridical perceptual experience as well in my erroneous, say, hallucinatory experience. So, for example, one might hold that illusory and veridical cases alike share a common sense datum with which I am acquainted. That's a very common form of this way of looking at things. The objector's error lies in his conception of the appearance, false or veridical, as being identical, rather than allowing of two different determinations of appearance. An appearance being either a case of the subject manifesting her emotional state or of her merely, or, or, or of its merely seeming to the observer that she is. Adopting this alternative and so-called disjunctive conception of emotional exper expression also shows how the objector's reasoning is fallacious. Because there are cases of failure in the expression of emotion by a person, it does not follow that when there is no such failure, 
when the person is not feigning, when her facial muscles are not damaged, and so on. Her appearance is not directly manifesting her emotional state, and that another person does not immediately perceive the emotional state in her appearance. Mutatis mutandis, a similar argument can be made regarding an artwork's expressing an emotion and recognition of the emotion by the artwork's audience. Because there can be cases of failure in the expression of emotion in an artwork by a person, it does not follow that when there is no such failure, the expression in the artwork does not directly manifest the artist's emotional state, and that the audience does not immediately perceive the emotional state in the artwork. A musical theme no less than a face may wear an expression, as Wittgenstein claims, where this means not merely exhibiting emotional expressiveness, but rather expressing a determinate emotion. I therefore hopefully have provided independent arguments to make plausible Tolstoy's claim that an artwork can express or communicate a distinctive emotion even in the case of hard non-representational music. Thus, I hope to have at least somewhat uh, explicated Wittgenstein's comment that, quote, there is much to be learned from Tolstoy's false theorizing about how a work of art conveys a feeling. Thank you. Mm -hmm.